This is the course Mechanical Vibration. In this chapter, we'll be describing the free vibration of a single degree of freedom system. Free vibration means that the mass is set of motion due to initial conditions or any other perturbance with no external force applied. We will have only spring or flexibility of the system that behaves as a spring, mass or any other system that accumulates kinetic energy and we will have weight and those are the forces that we will consider. To stop the free vibration we will have to determine the governing equation of the system and we will do that with using different methods. For undamped system we will introduce the concept of damped frequency, critical damping and damping ratio. The figures and content of this presentation are adapted from our textbook and this represents chapter number two. The learning objectives of these presentations are this following. We will define free vibration. We will derive the equation of motion of a single degree of freedom using different approaches as Newton's second law of motion and the principle of conservation of energy. We will linearize a nonlinear equation of motion. We will solve a spring mass damper system for different types of free vibration responses depending on the amount of damping. We will compute the natural frequency, the damping radio, and the frequency of damped vibrations. We will find the responses of system with Coulomb and hysteresic damping, and we will determine the stability of the system. Let's start by defining free vibration. A system is said to undergo free vibration when it oscillates under an initial perturbance or initial conditions with no external acting forces. So for example, oh, you can have a child in a swing, so he, he receives a push and then swings by itself, or a pendulum in an in a clock, right? Or an, in an inverted pendulum like this tower over here. Any system that is capable of accumulating kinetic energy and converting it to potential energy is capable to vibrate if it receives initial conditions. A single degree of freedom system. If we have only one degree of freedom, it means that only one coordinate is sufficient to describe the position of the system or the mass at any time. Several mechanical and structural systems can be idealized as a single degree of freedom system. In many practical systems, the mass is distributed, but for a simple analysis, it can be approximated by a single point of mass. The study of free vibration of an undamped and damped single degrees of freedom system is fundamental to understand the more advanced topic in vibration. Let's see an example of a system that has several masses and bars and pulleys, but this system, as complicated as it seems, it has only one degree of freedom. So all parameters can be expressed in terms of x which is the parameter that will describe the position of this mass one over here. And as you see, as this mass move, it will rotate this pulley and this bar is attached to the pulley. So the rotation of the pulley will be related to the displacement mass x as x over rp. And then this mass rotates at the pulley rotate because it's attached and it will push this cylinder which has rotation without slipping so the displacement of the center of mass is related to the rotation and then the rotation of this um, disc here this is x2 will be related to the displacement of x1 and the rotation of the disc will also be able to be related to the disc and that will also relate how much the spring 2 is compressed. When there is no element that causes dissipation of energy during the motion of the mass, we can say that the system is undamped. And we will work first with undamped single degree of freedom systems. 
In this type of systems, the amplitude of the motion remains constant with time and the system vibrates at its natural frequency. Let's see some examples. This is an idealization of the tall structure. You remember in the first chapter, we analyzed which would be the equivalent constant of a cantilever beam. In this example right here, we have a mass and a coir and another link. The position of this system could be defined in terms of x, in terms of theta, or in terms of this angle of rotation of this bar. We will have simple system as spring and mass, and we will also work with torsional system where this bar becomes a torsional spring and this inertia disk is the element that accumulates kinetic energy. Now let's find the governing equations of a undamped single degree of freedom system using the Newton's law or equation of motion. As you recall, we will add forces in x direction, forces in y direction, take moment respect to one point, in which case, for a rigid body, we will have the rotational component, which is the mass moment of inertia times the angular acceleration, plus the mass times the distance to the center of mass, cross product the acceleration of the point where we are taking moment. Let's start by a translational system, which we have a spring mass system. To our free body diagram, we have a coordinate system x, y, we have our weight, we have a normal forces. Since we are moving to the right, we have a spring force that will be equals to the constant of the spring times the displacement. We have the kinetic forces, which are mass times acceleration. And we, since we assume that we are moving to the right, this mass times acceleration goes to the right. When we apply forces in x direction, we get that negative kx will be equals to the inertia forces, which is mass times acceleration. The y direction doesn't contribute to any equations of motion because it just tells us that the normal force will be equals to the weight. Using the, the Lambert principle, where we can add the inertia forces to the same side of the equation as the external forces, and all that equals to zero, and it looks like a static equation. That will be our equation of motion or governing equation of our system. This equation is the typical equation of a spring mass system in which we have a term describe the inertia of the system or the kinetic part of the system which goes with the acceleration of the mass and then we have uh, the spring term which describes the elasticity of the system which goes with the displacement of the mass. And since we are talking about free vibration, this equation is equals to zero. It will not be equals to zero when we have an external force applied. Let's now do a torsional system. We do our free body diagram, and in this case, we have a three-dimensional coordinate system where the plane x, y is in the plane of my inertia disk. And we have a rotation along the c-axis. If we rotate the system contraclockwise, then we will have a resistant force due to the torsional spring that this bar represents. If we do our moment respect to C, we will have the torsional constant times the rotational displacement equals to the mass moment of inertia respect to point O times the angular acceleration, which is theta two dots. If we apply again the, the Lambert principle, in which case, we put everything in the same side of the equation, we get our equation of motion. Again, we will have one term, which represents the inertia part of the equation, multiplying the acceleration of the system plus 
a term that describes the elasticity of the system times the displacement, in this case, rotational displacement of the system. For undamped systems, we can also use the principle of conservation of energy to calculate the governing equations. In systems that do not have any dissipation, we could say that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy remains constant. This is equ this equation right here. Therefore, if we derive this equation, this expression becomes equals to zero. Recall the expressions for the potential energy. When we have a weight going up, we will gain potential energy, and the potential energy will be the weight times the distance that we go up. And if we go down, we will lose potential energy, and we will be the weight times the distance that we went down. The potential energy of a spring will be the potential energy of the final position minus the potential energy of the initial position. Recall that the potential energy of the spring is equals to one half the constant of the spring times the elongation or the reduction in length of the spring. It's very important that this S is equals to the final length minus the unstretched length. Then we have the kinetic energy. I review already this expression in chapter one. We have the translational component and we have the rotational component. And if we have one point that is zero velocity, this term will disappear. Or if we have no rotation, this term also will disappear. Or if we get the kinetic energy at the center of mass, this term will also disappear. Let's now do an example for a translational system, which is a spring mass system. The potential energy of this system will be one half K times the displacement of the system. We will assume that the spring is in unstrained position when X is equal to zero. And then we have the kinetic energy of the system, which is one half mass velocity of the mass squared. If we derive this expression respect to time, so we will derive the expression for the potential energy that gives me two times one half k times x. And since I am deriving respect to time, it's very important that I derive respect to x first. Using the change rule, I have to derive x respect to time. So I get here the velocity, which is x dot. When I derive the kinetic energy, the same thing, I am deriving respect to time. So I derive the velocity, but I have to derive that velocity respect to time. Therefore, I get the acceleration. When I cancel those terms out and add those terms together, I get this expression right here. This one is the kinetic term, and this one is respect to the potential energy. And as you see, I, both terms are multiplied by the velocity by x dot. So I can take x dot out. But x dot is the velocity and we cannot say that it's zero. These terms in the bracket have to be equals to zero and that's how we get the equation of motion or our governing equation for the system. Let's now work in the equation of motion or a spring mass system in vertical position. But first, the mass will hang in a position called the static equilibrium position, in which the upward spring force exactly balances the downward gravitational force of the mass. In this position, the elongation due to weight will be called the static deflection, and the total elongation of the spring will be the unstretched length of the spring plus the static deflection. Here, as you see, that's what is called the static equilibrium position. Let's draw the free body diagram. We have the weight and we have the spring force. The spring force will be the coefficient of the spring multiplied by the static deflation plus the displacement of the mass. And then we have the inertia forces, which is mass times acceleration. Using the equation of motion, we have the force of the spring minus the weight is equals to mass times acceleration. However, we have that the static deflection of the spring 
is equal to the weight. Therefore, those two terms cancel out and we get a very similar equation that we got before, but it's very important to know that this x is measured from the static equilibrium position. So we are already taking into consideration that the spring is deflected due to weight. We can use also energy methods, in which case we have the potential energy of the spring, which we will one half constant of the springs times the deflection of the spring minus what the weight went down is a loss in energy and the displacement is the static equilibrium position plus the displacement on the, of the mass. Then we have the kinetic energy, which is one half mass times velocity squared. If the systems have conservation of energy, we can derive these two equations respect to time, in which case remember that we have to use the change rule, so we have to derive respect to x, and then x respect to time, which gives us this term over here. The static deflation is a constant, so it's zero, and then we derive the position respect to time, give us the velocity. And we can extract the velocity because it's in, it multiplies every term. When we derive the kinetic energy, we have 2 times 1 half mass velocity and the derivative of the velocity respect to time, which is acceleration. Those two terms cancel out and we can take out the velocity and the, what is in the bracket is equal to zero and we get exactly the same equation using either the equations of motion or the energy method. Now we are going to work in the solution of the equation of motion. Mass times acceleration plus constant of the spring times displacement is equal to zero. The solution of this second order differential equation can be found by assuming that x is equal to a constant times exponential of st. If we derive this exponential, we know that the derivative of the exponential is the same exponential times s, and we, derive, we find the second derivative is s squared and the same exponential. If we substitute those terms into our equation, we can take out the term c times exponential of st. And since this term cannot be zero, then what is in the bracket, which is called characteristic equation, is equal to zero. The solution of this equation represents the eigenvalues of the equation. So we will make this a polynomial equals to zero, and the two solutions, as you see, are complex because we get a negative value inside our square root, and we can have two different solutions. If we write it as a complex number, we get i, square root of the constant of the spring, divided by the mass. But we define the natural frequency as that square root, so we can actually write our solution in terms of our natural frequency. Therefore, our solution becomes C1 times exponential of i omega t plus C2 exponential of negative i omega t. To better understand the solution, we use the Euler formula that establish the fundamental relation between the trigonometric functions and a complex exponential function. So recall this expression right here that E i s it becomes cosine of s plus i sine of. If we apply that to our equation, the solution becomes this term over here expands in cosine plus i sine, and this term over here expands as cosine omega t minus i sine omega t. If we put the terms that multiply cosine together and the terms that multiply sine together, we can rearrange our equation and then C1 and C2 are complex conjugate numbers. If we add them together, we get that C1 plus C2 is 2a and C1 minus C2i is 2b my i squared and i squared because of negative. So as you see, those 
constants are real. So we could rename them as A1 and A2, and then our solution have this form. A1 cosine of omega t plus A2 sine of omega t. You can write this equation in terms of only one cosine or only one sine with a phase angle. And that, in terms of cosine, we have only one amplitude, which is the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared, and that's cosine of omega t minus a phase angle, and the phase angle has this expression right here. Let's find a1, a2, or a and the phase angle for particular initial conditions. If we have that the displacement at zero is equals to x zero and the velocity at time zero is velocity zero, then we substitute the first expression here and we see that cosine of zero is one and sine of zero is zero. Therefore, we already have a one. We derive this expression. So deriving this expression gave us a1, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and the internal derivative is omega n, and the derivative of the sine is cosine times the internal derivative times a2, and then we substitute our initial condition of the velocity here, and sine of zero is zero, therefore we get that a2 is the initial velocity divided by omega n. We substitute these values in our expression and we get these values over here. Remember that a is the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared and the phase angle, the inverse tangent of a2 over a1. We have three different ways to write our solution. First, as a summation of a cosine function plus a sine function of our natural frequency times time, then as a single cosine function of n times with a phase angle and the amplitude will be the square root of the amplitude of the cosine square plus the amplitude of the sine square, and the phase angle will be defined as the inverse function of the tangent of a2 divided by a1. And the third way of writing our solution is using only a sine function. In this case, we add our phase angle and the phase angle will be defined as the inverse tangent of a1 over a2. All of these equations will draw the same curve with an amplitude equals to this expression right here. We have an initial position an initial velocity which represents the slope. We have a phase angle right here. And then we can read the period, which is the time elapsed between the two maximums. So when the curve completes a whole cycle, we have the frequency, which is the inverse of the period. And we have the circular frequency, which is 2 pi, the frequency. For an equation of motion of spring mass in a vertical position, we have to remember that x is measured from the static equilibrium position, and we have that the spring is already elongated the static deflection. Therefore, we have that the constant of spring times the static deflection is equal to the weight. We can write the natural frequency of the system either in terms of our constant of the spring, our mass, or in terms of the gravity divided by the static deflection. Our curve is exactly the same as the one we previously analyzed, but the, what it is important is that the system oscillates around the equilibrium position, not about, for example, the unstretched length of the spring. It oscillates around this point right here which is the static equilibrium position of the system. How does the position, velocity, and acceleration relate? As we have been talking in the previous slide, the position can be written in terms of a cosine with a phase angle. If we derive this equation, 
we get the velocity. As you see, is the derivative of the cosine, which is a negative sine, times the internal derivative, which is omega n, minus the same phase angle. However, we, as you know, the sine and the cosine are the same curve with a phase angle. So I can write this sine in terms of a cosine if I add pi half, which is 90 degrees. And if I derive this expression, I get the acceleration. As you see, the derivative of the sine is the cosine with the same phase angle, and the internal derivative gets me omega n squared. But again, since I have a negative value right here, this becomes a positive cosine curve with a phase angle of pi. So, as we see, the velocity leads the displacement by a pi half angle, or 90 degrees, and the acceleration leads the displacement by a phase angle equals to pi. This is our solution of the system, either as addition of a cosine and a sine function, or a cosine with a phase angle. There is particular cases, for example, if we have that the initial displacement is zero, the first terms become zero and we have as only a sine equation. But we can write that sine equation in terms of a cosine if we add an angle of pi half. The second term is when we have velocity equals zero, therefore this second term is equals to zero. The value of the phase angle needs to be calculated with care. The tangent of that angle can be positive when the initial conditions are both positive or both negative. Thus, we need to use the first quadrant for the phase angle when both initial conditions are positive, or the third quadrant when the displacement is positive and the velocity is negative. Similarly, since the tangent of the phase angle can be negative when both are have opposite signs, we need to use the second quadrant when the displacement is negative and the velocity is positive, and the fourth quadrant when the displacement is positive and the velocity is negative.